Uh, welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. None of us is immune to that old game about people once in the public eye. I suppose you could call it the whatever happened to game. In this case, the woman generally considered the most beautiful and desirable in the world, Marcy Herrick. The first accident, of course, was a ten-day wonder. But the second didn't get as much publicity, though it took Marcy into a coma and eventually forever out of sight and out of mind. Oh. All right, all right, clear the area. How do they always know, nurse? These disaster hounds, I don't know, Sergeant. They always sniff it out, chase the ambulance at the same one in the news. Who is it this time? Marcy Herrick. Same old problem. Arbitrary poison? What else? Check the intern. She's in coma. They'll butt over tea kettle all the way downstairs for good measure. Yeah. No one thought when I got the call? Let the lady be. I mean, considering that what she's got is a hell of a lot more than any one of us have. That never, never land she keeps trying to get back to. Sure must be something special. <laughs> mystery drama, The Prison of Glass, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Lois Nettleton. It's... Marcy Herrick, an American symbol, blend of Judy Garland and Marilyn Monroe, adored by countless millions Picked by fortune to be the brightest of stars, but confined by the smothering adulation of the fans to life in a goldfish bowl. Child of fortune, queen of misfortune, a national tragedy of mob nonviolence. This is her story. All my life, I dreamed of being here. Inside this glass paperweight, with the feathery snow under my feet, and the dark little house with a bright red door beckoning to me to enter it and discover its secrets at last. No more wondering if I could really see a tiny shadow across the window under the eaves, or the handsome, dark face I pretended to myself looked out from the Oreo window on the ground floor. Well... Now I am here at last. And all I want to do is break out of my glass prison. I want to scream till the glass shatters. So terrible to look out, seeing everything magnified, and knowing that the one possession I love the best has ended up being a prison and may be shut away in forever. <laughs> Marcy, where are you? In the living room, Mother. What are you doing? I'm <laughs> playing with this paperweight. How pretty the snowstorm is. So many years since I saw snow. And since... Now, don't you ever get over Fred? Get him off your mind. Pop? No. I'll never forget him. Do you? Of course I don't. But there's no point dwelling on the dead. Every time I see the paperweight, it's like... Like he was still in the room. Laughing that funny, deep way he did. Pleased that I was pleased with my present. It's too long ago to still be mourning for him. Why? Because he's gone. I'd like to make an end of that silly child toy sometimes. You're too old to play with toys. But this isn't a toy. It's a real old antique. Pop told me. Look, look at the little house. And the trees planted around. And the path leading over the little hill to the door. And turn it upside down and then right side up and watch the snowflakes fall. Look, Mother, wouldn't you love to be small enough and to be able to somehow get inside there and walk up that path and knock on the door? Who do you suppose would open it? Oh, Marcy, that's enough nonsense. You know who I keep being sure it would be? Who? Pop. That's who it would be. Pop. Now, that is all. You put the paperweight down and come and get dressed. 
We've got a million things to do to get ready for the contest. Come on. Mother, do I have to go? To the finals? But you're going to win. So what? Well, first of all, it means money. And second, it means you can enter the state contest. And after that... I don't want to go. Why not? I hate being stared at and walked around and examined as though I was a prize heifer or, or an animal in a zoo. Something even worse. What are you talking about? You should see how the men look at you in the bathing suit parade and where their eyes go. It's, it's humiliating, degrading. You mean you'd let me down? After I've devoted every minute of my life to you, Working as a cleaning woman, doing other people's dirty work just so I could give you a decent home and a chance in life. I know, Mom. I want to pay you back, but not this way. Well, how else? You know, I haven't got much time left to me with my heart condition. How are you going to make enough money to pay off the debts I've had to run up? Oh, no, sir. You want to pay me back, Marcy Gerstenberg? You follow the path I set for you. You'll see. One day, you're going to be a star. I don't want to be a star. But you can decide that when you get there. Because I'm going to keep pushing you till you get to the top. Even if it kills the both of us. Well, it killed Mom, all right. Within a few years. And it killed me. A little bit at a time. The paperweight became a kind of symbol for me. Inside it, I might be safe and private. If the faces were peering in at me there, I could always hide in the soft snow. But there was never a chance to hide. Because even when Mom stopped pushing me and got really sick, there was always someone else. First of all, the man who changed my name. My agent. You know, what is it? Marcy Herrick, you're damn right, sent her in. Little Miss Sunday School, what you think she's trying to do to me? Good morning, Dave. Come in and shut the door. What's good about it? Well, we're both alive. Well, if I didn't invest so much time and bread in you already, you wouldn't be for long, sister. I'd break that alabaster neck of yours with my bare hands. Don't be mad. Mad? I'm on my sixth alpha pill this morning. Why'd you stand up Nicholas Sagat for yesterday? The guy's an octopus. I just couldn't take it again. Well, you're not a teenager anymore. You know he's got a part in his picture that can make you. You'll land this part, do it the way you're told, and we're at the start of the payoff at last. I got an investment in you I want back. Is that all I am to you? A warm body you can pedal? Oh, cut the sarcasm, baby. It's not your style. You got a mother in the hospital who's expensive to maintain. You want to keep her there? Sergio will never see me now, but I stood him up. I fixed it. I had him on the phone 15 minutes this morning. I'd eat plenty crow, but I fixed it. Oh. Now, wait a minute. If you have any idea now, that look, I'm... I'm a louse, a hard-nosed son of a gun, but I have some standards. I pulled a little hearts and flowers. I told him you had to go see your mother in the hospital. That's where I was. And I figured... With all you've got going for you and a mother who needs you, I don't know what it is that you keep running from. I think you still ought to be seeing a good shrink. No. Well, it's your business, I guess, but do you make the appointment I set up with Sergei today at two? I guess so. You'd better, because this time, for one reason or another, I'm going to be with you. Meet me in this office quarter to two and wear some lipstick and a dress that fits tight. <laughs> ah, Miss Herrick. I'm delighted to meet you again, at last. And Mr. Morgan. Hi, Nick. It really wasn't necessary for you to escort your charming client. She is perfectly safe with me. Marcy has a back-to-back appointment with Multinational for the ingenue lead in the new feature. I'm playing chauffeur for her because her own car is laid uh, Oh, I see. Well, well then I, I won't keep you long. Just sit down, everyone, please. Thank you. Well, I had forgotten how beautiful you are. What a pity. You mean the part is cast? No, no, no. I mean only that your time is so short today. I would have liked to go over the shooting script with you personally. Well, if I can get a copy of the script, I'd be happy to come back and read for you. Uh, no, no, no. I don't, I don't work that way. I mean, I must learn to know the actor. I have him or her learn to know me. We must establish a, a rapprochement. No? I mean, it is, as we say, a one-to-one situation. No? However... I'm sure we can let Miss Herrick have a scene, a few pages, to give her the 
the feeling of the party. How soon can we meet again? Well, if you're in, under any pressure, Mr. Smith. <laughs> when are we not? When are we not, all of us? Name the time and the place. I'll have my client there. All right, my bungalow on the set. Day after tomorrow at, say, 5.30. We'll be there. She. A one-to-one -one situation, as I said. She'll be there. Right, Marcy? Right, Dave. You make the dates. I keep them. I can't blame Dave. Nothing overt was even particularly hinted at. It was a business appointment. It was an exceptional part. And I was an actress. How much of my private self I was willing to surrender for a career was my own business. So, I kept my appointment at 5.30 with Nicholas Sergat. Ready, I suppose, to <sighs> deliver. And I received a surprise. What he seemed to be interested in was my talent. Whether I was right for the part. We went over the scene again and again, and finally he said... No, it still isn't right. But, but all the capability is there. The part is yours if you want it. But of course I do. <laughs> I don't know what to say. As far as the part is concerned, we'll let your agent handle that. But as for us, now that is something else again. Uh-oh. No, no. <laughs> don't jump to the obvious conclusion. Which is true enough, Marcy. I am a man. I'm not a stone. And that's what my contract depends on? Don't be silly. I can have a hundred partners more sensual, more practiced, or more perverted than you. For us, there's something different. Isn't there always? Marcy. Marcy, please grow up. I'm talking of something... Something that I see in you beyond the simple urge of sex. Something that you will communicate to every man as strongly as you do to me. What our final relationship will be is, is kind of hard to say. I mean, it's compounded of so many things. Director, actress, husband, wife, lover, neophyte. But none of that is important. What is, is that here and now, I tell you, you will play in my picture. And from it, a star will be born. Oh, he was persuasive and and he made me believe him. Incredible to think that we never recognize, except in hindsight, the turning points of life. And that in this moment, with these few words, Nicholas Sergat had shaped my future entrapment and sealed his own death at my hands. Murder from someone as gentle and dependent as Marcy? And by what means? And to what end? And if indeed there was murder, by what instrument that leads to the strange imprisonment we first found Marcy immersed in at the beginning of our story? I'll return in a moment with Act Two. of you will be old enough, I imagine, to remember the headlines at the time. Marcy Herrick, injured in fall. Beloved star in coma. Even if you don't remember them, they have little significance, for this is the true story behind those headlines. A story best told by Marcy herself. I played in Nick's picture, an experience I don't know if I'd want to live through again, except it shaped my life. All right, now let's have it absolutely quiet. We have the sticks. Back. But really, there's nothing to explain. You've made yourself perfectly clear. I have my options. The one thing I'm permitted to do is choose. Heads or tails. Cut. Uh, okay. Uh, just bury that. Kill the lights. We're, uh, we're on a break. Uh, Marcy, uh, come on. I'll talk to you in your dressing room. I don't care what the lines seem to say, darling. It's what they mean. 
what they must convey to the audience. Oh, why? What, what should they convey except exactly what they say? Well, please stop talking from a naive day of your own personal morals. You think you have any choice? Why shouldn't I? Because this picture has nothing to do with your own personal little never-never land. That's why. It's real. It's here. It's where it's at. In the particular situation you find yourself in this script, in the part you are playing, you have no choice. And in spite of what you say, you have to know that. That I have no choice? Exactly. And I'm playing myself? Exactly. Why do you think you were cast in this? Because you think that's all I'm capable of doing. Because I think that's what the audience wants to see. To buy. Because the quality of you is going to make you a star. What, what does that mean? It's a dichotomy, a contradiction, a fascinating enigma. The girl with everything, looks, figure, sex, a voice that ripples through everyone from the heart right down. And yet... And yet what? The other side. The feeling of a little girl lost. That everyone wants to protect, to fuss over, arrange for, shield from harm. But I don't need to be shielded. And I'm not a sex symbol. The truth the is... The truth that... is you need a guardian, if not a lover. Now, I want to be both. We ought to be married. I'm not ready to be married yet. Perhaps not. But for your mother's sake, I think you better be. What's my mother got to do with this? Everything. She has a dream for you that she knows you'll never win for yourself. A dream that might occur to you that I don't share. Don't be ridiculous. There isn't a girl in the world who would pass up the chance to be a star. I won't even answer that. I just want to know how you know about my mother. Okay. I went to visit her in the hospital. Uh, my old world upbringing, perhaps. One asks the parents of the girl one wants to marry for their permission. Or at least tacit agreement. Since the father is dead, one goes to the mother. Oh, good Lord. It's happening all over again. I'm not a person. I'm a commodity. Oh, why can't you all just leave me alone? To be what? To be a... I, I, I don't know what. I never even seem to have a chance to find out for myself. To be Marcy Gerstenberg, first off, After I guess... After this picture, Marcy Gerstenberg will no longer exist. There will only be Marcy Herrick. And if I don't want to be Marcy Herrick... Pretty hard to escape. There's also one contract I don't think you could break. What? An unwritten one. It's with a very sick lady in the hospital. Mom. Your mother was going to have open heart surgery. Very expensive oh, surgery. No, no. Don't. Don't. Just Marcy. Darling, what is it you're afraid of? I mean, most girls would give their eye teeth for the career that beckons you. Why in the world don't you want it? I don't know. Because I want simpler things. A man to love, children, never to ask anything more from them than they want to give. Sometimes myself, I need that. My own snow paper white world. What? Nothing. Just special things, my own. But most of all, Nick... I just don't feel I have the talent. I mean, just look at me on the set. I can't get things the way a real actress should. Baby, who wants you to be an actress? I want you to be you. No one else. If I can achieve that, if, if you can, you'll be one of the greatest. I'm, I know you're going to be. But you need help. I think I can offer it. And best as your husband. But I don't want to be married. But it's what you need. You have to be guided, shaped, protected. And if I refuse? Well, I might have to make a change in casting. Unfortunately for you, on the production end, there is an escape clause. Among other things, you'd be throwing away a lot of money. A lot of necessary money in your case, because... You don't, you don't have to hammer it home. Like my part in the picture, I have no options. Not even heads or tails. Marcy, you missed the point. 
It's the same option. There's always choice. Win or lose. Before I went to the hospital that night, I sat idly tilting my snowstorm paperweight in my hands, watching the snow, trying to let it calm me as it used to. But not tonight. All I could think of were phrases like caught in a vice, trapped, a squirrel in a cage. And then, without any decisions, I went to see Mother. Marcy? Dave, what are you doing here? Oh, I, I drop by now and again to say hello. To Mom? Well, sure. I mean, we go a long way back, her and me, you know. How is she tonight? No use you going in there. They have a, you know, like, knocked out. She's worse? Well, it's why I hung around. I called you at home, but you'd already left. The doc is waiting to see you. Why? Well, I guess this is it. They're going to have to operate. It was a long operation. Over six hours. And Dave sat with me in the waiting room all the way. People talk about a lot of things in the small hours of the night. Not me, but Dave did. And as he talked, I was suddenly seeing him through different eyes, realizing that once in the past, before Dad came along, Mom and he had been quite close. Now, let's get it straight again. Your contract with Nicholas Sagat and his production company only promises to deliver your services as an actress. I know that, Dave, but maybe he's right. This is what I'm to do. I need someone like him to... To, to play Trangali to your trilby? It doesn't have to be that melodramatic. It doesn't have to be at all. I need money for Mom. Especially if... Please, God. She comes through. If it's money, I got it. Well, even if I... Even if I did borrow from you, Dave, then that's all it could be. It isn't the answer. First off, I, I'd have no guarantee that I could pay it back. But more important, I need success for Mom to make up to her for all she never had. You still don't have to marry her. I'm sort of an old-fashioned girl. And Nick and I were married. And Tales You Win became a colossal hit. And suddenly, it seemed, although it took two or three years... I was miraculously everything Mom had wanted to be. Damn it. What are you sitting on your rear end there for? Come on. We've got a party to go to. Big deal. Big connection. Oh, I'm beat tonight, Nick. I can't go anywhere. Well, you, you're you going to go somewhere. This is this, this feature's up for grabs. I want it. I need it. Then go alone, darling. What do you need me for? <laughs> I suppose the curse of my life is naivete. It took Dave to explain that to me later. He was on the way out when he married him. He latched onto you as a meal ticket. He wanted you with him because he needed you. You're all that keeps him alive. What? Oh, baby, he knew he had it in you from the beginning. Sure, he gave you your first chance, but almost from that day on, he's been writing your skirt tales. What are you trying to say? I'm not trying. I'm laying on the line. Marcy Herrick is alive and living well in Hollywood. Nicholas Sergat is dead and owes his existence to you not only now, but pretty near from the first day he met you. You mean that all these years he's been using me? About the size of it, sweetie. <gasps> oh, what a fool I've been. Oh, now, wait a minute. You were caught in a nut crack. Oh, no, not anymore. Now that Mom is gone. Okay, Dave. I'll take care of the rest of it. But it wasn't all that simple. Ever since my mother's death, working the heavy schedule I had to face, trying to be a decent wife to a man I thought I owed so much to, other habits had developed. The blessed uppers. Those nice little pills that gave you enough energy to fight through the long days of shooting. And even more welcome, the lovely pills that let you sleep. And while that sleep was coming, allowed you to slip back to childhood with a snowstorm paperweight in hand, searching for someone going up the path, or for that face that 
you never could quite see in the window, but which somehow spelled love and all the answers. What are you doing just sitting here, Marcy? Nothing, Nick. Just playing with my favorite toy. Uh, that damn paperweight is about the measure of your brain. Let's have a drink. Come on, we, we should celebrate. What for? I just set you up for a nice new picture. How nice. Do I want to do it? 700000 net and a percentage of the gross. What's the part? What's the diff? It's duck soup for you. You feed at the same trough? Uh, what does that mean? You direct, of course? Of course. If I play? What's all the flack here? What? Just about my playing. Why? I don't think I want to do a new picture. I think I'd rather play with this. Oh, that silly toy. I'm telling you, one day I'm going to take it from you. I'm going to smash it. <laughs> My mother once said that. Yeah, well, she should have gone. Uh, I, as I think I'm going to do right. No. No. Come on, give me. Come on, give me. Don't do that. Get out, yeah, Tommy. Go away, you drunken fool. Don't do that. You. Nick. Oh. Nick, are you all right? You. Blood. You hit your head on the end iron. Or did I... Did I hit you with a paperweight? What? I don't know. I, I don't know. What, what, what have I done? I killed him. <laughs> Marcy shifts her gaze from the man, prone and unmoving on the floor, to the beloved paperweight in her hand, somehow tinged with blood. Accident or murder? We don't know yet. Even in the mildest of people, the force is unleashed when their privacy is invaded or something they treasure threatened are as primeval as the tiger that lives in all of us. I'll return shortly with Act Three. keeping the story out of the papers or off radio and TV. You'll remember what headlines it made for ten days until the investigation was over and Marcy was completely exonerated. Officially, that is. Unofficially, the self-declared insiders, the wise and the worldly, the Hollywood rumor factory that never shuts down, knew better. Nick was an anchor around her neck. She couldn't get rid of any other way good for her. More power to her for having the nerve and for getting away with it. And then there was Marcy herself. I knew all about the talk behind my back. It destroyed me like the Chinese water torture. Because of all people, I least of all exonerated myself in Nick's death. For years, I'd hated him for what he'd made me do. I'd wanted him dead, wanted to kill him. And that night was a blank in my mind. I went to pieces. Now I wanted to die. There was nothing left for me. The pills. That's all I lived on. All that kept me alive. Marcy, you got to listen to me, baby. I killed him, Dave. I killed him. You did, and he was falling down drunk. He had his head on the end. No. I he killed himself. No, I wished him dead. Same thing. Marcy, you need help. I, I have a doc. No, there's no help for me. We struggled, Dave, because he wanted to break my paperweight. I pushed him, and that's how he fell. It was still an accident. Maybe. I don't know. I don't remember. Oh, Dave. Oh, Dave, I don't want to go on living. There's nothing left. Oh, now, knock that off. I've got three major features lined up for you as soon as you pull yourself together. But you've got to get some help There's first. There's no help for me anywhere. Except maybe inside here. If I could just walk through the powdery snow 
and up the little path and over the hill to the house. Then maybe there'd be help. The secret of my life is here. Somewhere inside here. I've always known that. If I could only get in there and unlock the future, maybe I could find a way to want to live. Why do you believe that so strongly? Hmm? What? Who are you? Paul. Paul Barkley. Uh, Dr. Paul Barkley. Who? <sighs> Don't you remember? Dave Morgan recommended me to you and brought you to me. I don't remember coming here. I should think that's quite possible under the circumstances. What circumstances? You were barely semi-conscious. Oh, I, I know. I... I'd taken a tranquilizer. A barbiturate. A little heavier than a tranquilizer. Who are you? I told you. Dr. Paul Barkley. Where am I? In my office. You should be in a hospital. What kind of doctor are you? Psychiatrist. <laughs> so you think I'm crazy? No. I think the whole world is. Or sane. Or... Somewhere in between. That's the human condition. You sound kind. But yeah. I wouldn't go to the hospital. But you would come to see me here? It wouldn't do any good. But you could try. After all, we have met and become acquainted. It isn't as if you were buying a pig in a poke. <laughs> so did mine. That gives us something in common. <laughs> you liked your father, didn't you? Oh, yes. Didn't you yours? Oh, yeah. We got along just fine. Still do. Oh, you're so lucky. Mine, mine is... Uh... A long, long time ago. Mm, not for me. It always seems just like yesterday. I'm sorry. Why did you love your father so much? Oh, he sort of, um, didn't care. I mean, everything rolled off his back, you know. Now, Mother, Mother was always doing and planning and pushing herself and me and everyone. But Dad always found time to sit back and chuckle, tell a funny story. You didn't like your mother? I loved her. Well, maybe you were a little jealous of her. Why, why would I be jealous of her? Because she was the one who was married to your father, not you. The paperweight isn't an obsession with me. I just love it because... Because what? Because it was the last present he ever gave me. And all this stuff about wanting to lose yourself inside it. Oh, I... I don't know. I, I don't know. I think it's because when I when I became famous, I felt I was living in a goldfish bowl. There was no place to hide. Mm -hmm. And then after, I mean, I, I'd keep thinking somehow if I were in there, I'd find out the real truth about me. Well, aren't you beginning to get a glimmering of the truth just from all our talks? I don't know what you mean. Tell me. It wouldn't do any good for me to tell you, Marcy. You have to find that out for yourself. I didn't know what Paul meant. But I did know one thing. More and more every day I was conscious of it. For the first time in my adult life, I was in love. I was hopelessly deeply in love with Paul Barkley. Something I don't think he could know. Or would be talking about. You've got to be kidding, Paul. I wish I were. No, but just when you're really beginning to help her, get her back to herself. I've got to disqualify myself now. It's too dangerous. Just because Marcy's fallen in love with you? Isn't that part of the whole analysis picture? <laughs> the transference of love, hate. The psychoanalyst takes the place of the well, in this case, the father. Sure. That's one thing that happened. We expected. One reason I have to bow out. Well, I don't get it. All right. 
but as simply as possible. In this case, I can no longer be objective or handle it. Because you see, the tables are turned. The doctor has fallen in love with his patient. But don't, don't worry, Dave. I have the best men in the business ready to take over. The only trouble was, I didn't want the best men in the business. I wanted Paul. And when I found I wasn't to have him, never dreaming how he felt about me, it was my father again. And the only way I could find him was to cross the border to where he was. That's why I took the overdose of pills. And that's why, barely conscious as they took hold, some instinct of preservation helped me drag myself from the bed and head for downstairs in the open air. I never made it. Instead, I stumbled at the head of the stairs and pitched helplessly like a rag doll to a senseless heap at the bottom. What's happening, Paul? How is Marcy? Some superficial bruises, nothing. Well, is she conscious? No. Well, she's still in coma. From the pills? No, that's impossible. The hospital is taken care of to get them completely out of her system. Then it's the fall. No. There's no indication that that's the cause. But why is she in a coma? One of the aspects of the problem, catatonia. Fortunately, one of the easiest in its early stages to correct. I don't care what medical name it is. How do you bring her out of it? That's a good question. I wish I knew. I have a key, but it's too late to use it to unlock Marcy's jail. When I first found myself locked inside the glass paperweight... I had no fear, only a surging sense of joy that at last I was where I wanted to be. I hurried up the path through the gently falling snow, which was warm and almost tickled like feathers, to knock on the little red door. Who is it? Where is that? Wait a minute. Yeah? Pop! Who are you? Marcy! It's been a long time. I don't remember so well. Oh, you... You couldn't forget me. We were so close, Pop. You and me. So close. Uh, well, you know, you ain't close to me, Bright Eyes, is this little model. Or the next one. Or the next one after that. You mean... I just... made you up? The way... I wanted you to be not the way you were at all. Maybe. What's the difference? That's your problem. Thanks. For what? For telling me. For waking me up. Look at her, Paul. She could be dead. If I can't find a trigger, she might as well be. Oh, that silly paperweight. How, how did it get to the hospital? It was clasped in her hand. We had to force her fingers open to free it. She's so damned intense. Why is this piece of junk so important to her? It's a symbol, Dave. Why was her father so important? Was he so wonderful? Jack Gersenberg? <laughs> the jerk of the world. Sober, he was a lump of clay. With some drinks in him, he was always on. Life of the party. Funny, for sure. Appealing. The, the women went for him, but he was a paced up man. Not a human feeling in his whole lousy, non existent soul. Then why did Marcy set so much store in him? And in his presence? Oh, I don't know. Maybe because it's the one thing he ever gave her in his entire life. And for this nothing, someone like her has to be destroyed? Oh, damn him. Damn this silly thing. Somebody ought to have got rid of it long ago. Oh. <laughs> I must be out of my mind. Why would I do a thing like that? Maybe because the man upstairs, if there is one, put it in your mind. Uh, oh. Oh, 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 Marcy. Oh, where are you? Marcy, I need you. I'm right here, Marcy. Right where you can touch and feel me. Oh, oh don't go away. Please, don't you ever worry. 
I'll never be farther from you than a whisper can carry. That's how I escaped from my glass prison. And how I became Mrs. Paul Barclay. In a private world with three children and happiness and no need to look further. So, to the press and all the media, I am no longer news or interesting, even to you who are listening. The story is finished. The beginning of everything for me, but for you, the end. your answer to whatever happened to Marcy Herrick. This time, I'm as happy to tell you as I am happy with the answer. One further thing to add, but after I return shortly. A very brief postscript, but an important one. Neither I, nor Marcy, nor Dr. Paul Barkley would like to leave the impression that she was miraculously cured overnight. The ravages of the mind must be mended as carefully as those of the body, but with time, care, and equal devotion from patient and doctor, more and more of them, as we advance, even in adversity, can be and are. It isn't always one, but there is still hope for the human race. Our cast included Lois Nettleton, John Newland, Hans Conried, Peg Lacentra, and Barry Kroger. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. The Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs>